when that opportunity came about, it was a terrible time. It was six months after I'd started the restaurant. I didn't have a pot to piss in. And, uh, you know, I just sucked it up and went out and borrowed more money. And I bought that bourbon and I figured out how to do it. You're listening to Barrel Talk, a podcast diving deep into what drives leaders in the whiskey industry. My name is Kevin Bridge. I'm a photographer and whiskey enthusiast. I'm sitting down with people who've dedicated their lives to whiskey to hear their stories and why they're so passionate about their craft. Bourbon and barbecue just makes sense. And Kerry Bringle has been bringing his professional barbecue experience to bourbon for years now with a unique understanding of how wood affects whiskey. That's where Peg Leg Pork or Bourbon was born. It's a brand built around a way of life that's defined by a life-changing moment Carrie went through as a teenager. Your whiskey story didn't start in whiskey. It started in food, and specifically barbecue. Explain to me how you got into barbecue to, to begin with. Yeah, I started cooking barbecue, I don't know, uh... 35 or 40 years ago, I would cook with my grandfather, Jack. Uh, he would do uh, old country-style ribs, and we'd do smoked burgers, and um, we would sit in his backyard just on an old PK. That's the original PK uh, grill and put the fire to one side and smoke on the other. Uh, my Uncle Bruce also uh, smoked turkeys and, and cooked barbecue and uh so I learned from him as well, just sitting beside him, uh, you know, <clears throat> on an old uh, grill with a, with the a fire on one side, smoking, you know, on the other. And uh, so I started cooking barbecue at a very young age. I continued that on through uh, high school and college, and then um, eventually ended up uh, starting a – I was on a competition team down in Memphis in May, uh, called Hog Wild. I was a founding member of that team after they switched from being the Rolling Wonder Pigs to Hog Wild. And uh, then I broke away from that team. I cooked with that team for 12 years, I think. Now I broke away from that team and started a new team called the Peg Leg Porkers. In the, in the, uh, I was a bourbon drinker, and every time I cooked barbecue, I would drink bourbon. In the uh, course of trying to get that team started. It's a very expensive to compete in Memphis and Mesa. I was looking for sponsors, and one of the sponsors that I wanted to get was a bourbon sponsor. That was my dream. You know, if I could get a bourbon sponsor, then it would be great. And my friend worked for Jim Beam, and so we thought we had Maker's Mark as a sponsor. It turned out they were sponsoring another team down there. So uh, we were able to get Jim Beam Black as a sponsor and started working with Jim Beam uh, Black and, and Jim Beam in general. We still work with them to this day on Memphis in May. They still um, are a sponsor for that barbecue team. <clears throat> I started my restaurant about eight years ago, and uh, I wanted to do. I wanted to take the bourbon further, and so uh, the same guy that had gotten me into the Beam relationship had now moved on to being a vice president at a, a liquor distributor. Uh, we had tried to go down the road with Bean for several years in doing some sort of partnership to release some sort of product. And they're just too big. You know, it's a very large company, and that was a, a, trying to get through that bureaucracy was going to be tough. And so uh, I was able to buy a batch of bourbon that was distilled and aged here in Tennessee and start the Peg Leg Porter uh, bourbon uh, company or spirits company. <clears throat> Since then, I developed a process where I take that bourbon that we source and run it through hickory charcoal, and that's the way that we finish our product. So the Lincoln County process is running through sugar maple charcoal before it goes into the barrel after it's distilled, and the I developed a process where we let it age, uh, and then when we're debarreling it before bottling it, we run it through hickory charcoal to give it our extra finish and filter. And that's worked well for us. We won several medals with the bourbon now. And so we've been doing that for seven and a half years. And uh, that's how I got into the uh, that's how I got into the bourbon business. Well now we'll we'll get into the bourbon in a little bit, but what is the 
competitive barbecue scene like? Because I've, I mean, I've seen the TV shows. Is it anything like what the what they show on TV? Yeah, I mean, I've been on several of the TV shows, and and a lot of that's you know for show. But it's I never was a. We went and did probably the most competitions I ever did in a single year might have been five or six. I wasn't running the circuit like some of these guys will do thirty competitions a year. And I was doing the the MBN circuit, which is the Memphis Barbecue Network. So it was all just pork. Mm-hmm. You either did whole hog, shoulder, or ribs. And you could on the regional competitions you could cook in all three. Um, but there was an on site presentation for each category. So for each category that you cooked, you had to turn in a blind box and then you had to do three on site judges. And so when we go do a competition, I might have to do nine presentations mm-hmm. in a morning, just back to back to back to back to back. It, when, it, when a barbecue competition started out, it used to be that you cooked what you cooked for your friends and family, and you put it in a box, and you turned it in, and that was it. And when they came on site, you showed them your personality, you showed them the product, you were able to explain to them what you did, and that was it. <clears throat> These days, it's become much more complex. It's uh, with the rise of the Kansas City Barbecue Society that really dominates the, the, the barbecue, you know, competition circuit. But they do brisket, uh, pork, uh, butt, uh, ribs, and chicken. And uh, it's all just blind. But uh, those guys are tricking it out and using different rubs and marinades and injections and uh you know it might rub it down with some pink salt to give it a smoke ring without actually even smoking it you know beforehand and there's just a lot of a lot of things that they do I, I tell people that competition barbecue these days is typically a bastardization of what you would serve in a restaurant or to your friends and family <laughs> now, i don't say that in a negative way uh i say that to be honest that You do things in a competition to that meat, typically, that you would not do in your restaurant or at home for your family because they're looking for one bite. You know, the judge gets about one bite of your stuff, maybe two, and if they're not blown away by that flavor, if it's not something different or unique in a good way, then you're not going to win. And so I'm not big on competitions much anymore. We do we do Memphis in May because it's the Super Bowl of swine, and I've been doing it for 28 years. But we don't go compete in other things. Uh, it's just, uh, well, one, we don't have the time, and uh, two, it's just become so drastically different than, than what I'm used to or really like to do that uh, it, it's, not, it's not something I, I want to do much anymore. You eventually opened a restaurant. So yes. how did you go from competing um, in a handful of uh, events around the country to owning a restaurant in Nashville? Well, I had a career. I had a career in healthcare, and then also in um, in uh, technology. And uh, and along the way, I had started several companies. So whether I did them full time or whether I did them on the side, I was a entrepreneur at heart, and I had always had my own thing. Since the age of probably 15, I had started companies, whether it was selling T-shirts or selling gourmet meats or or, uh, in the healthcare industry. So I had that entrepreneurial spirit. I knew I wanted to do a restaurant someday. I thought I wouldn't do it until I retired, but it just got to me, and I, uh, I, I got to a point where I thought it was time, and ended up doing it and it ended up being a good, a good time to do it. And, um, we, we've had a lot of success. What, uh, when did, was the restaurant founded? Uh, eight years ago. Okay. And so obviously eventually you made it to whiskey. So you started trying to find your own whiskey to sell in your own restaurant. Is that right? Well, I had an opportunity and I, my buddy that I worked with knew that I wanted to do my own bourbon brand. And Peg Lake Porker was always a, a lifestyle. Uh, it wasn't just the competition team. It wasn't just the restaurant uh, or our sauces and rubs. It was always a lifestyle. And people on my team felt that lifestyle. They, we lived it. And so 
um, <clears throat> the bourbon was the next evolution of that and certainly something that I had always wanted in my portfolio. And so when that opportunity came about, it was a terrible time. It was six months after I'd started the restaurant. I didn't have a pot to piss in. And, uh, you know, I just sucked it up and went out and borrowed more money, and I bought that bourbon, and I figured out how to do it. Um, we're still a non-distilling producer. We, uh, we are, we've now started to lay down our own product with contract distilling. But previously, we bought batches that are distilled and aged here in Tennessee that I've hand-selected of various ages. And then we've run them through our process of the hickory charcoal filtering, which makes it unique and makes it different than what anybody else is doing. And so what, how did, how did you start? What is the process like? What, what are the steps that you had to take to do it? Cause I, I'm sure you just can't just start buying bourbon and start selling it. No, you can't. No, you can't. And it's uh, and a lot of people, you know, I get that sometimes people are like, Oh, so you just bought somebody else's bourbon and slapped your label on it. Well, I could do that. And I said, well, good luck to you. I hope you have deep pockets and big balls. Cause it is not uh, for the faint of heart. It's a, uh, it's a difficult process. There's a lot of federal requirements. You have to find, you know, somebody to work with that can co-pack or bottle for you. Uh, you have to understand the process, the legalities involved. Um, you got to have something that makes your product unique or you stand out or at least have a story. Um, and that's a mistake that a lot of people make is they don't have any story. And I like the fact that you're highlighting stories because so many people, they – they're like, well, me and my uncle Billy were, we sat in a garage and we thought we'd like to have our own bourbon. And so we started one and, you know, people are like, well, that's cool. Actually, it's more like two mules fighting over a turnip. Nobody cares. You know, <laughs> it, uh, nobody, you, you have to have something compelling to make me want to pick that up off the shelf. The branding, the packaging, the, the, the flavor profile, something has got to compel you to want to get that product. Then beyond just getting it in the bottle, which is one, expensive, two, time consuming, and three, uh, just fraught with regulations, you have to go out and try and find distributors. And right now, these distributors are inundated with uh, people that want to put their brand on the shelf, but they have no long-term plan, they have no long-term supply, and that distributor looks at them and says, why do I want to fool with you? Uh, you know, when you may run out next week and then that's it. What am I, why would I invest any time in something that's not going to make me any long-term money or have a long-term relationship? And so you have to build those relationships and it is a very close knit network of people and, uh, and relationships. And so that's what, uh, that's what we've been able to do over the years and we started to build those relationships over the years before we ever even put drop one in a bottle. And so, um, you know, that, that's what it, that's what it takes. And so you mentioned you have to have a story. You can't just put something in a bottle and sell it. Right. And well, you don't have to, <laughs> you can put something in a bottle and try and sell it. You just may not sell it very much. Exactly. It. Unless it's the greatest product in the world, you know, it just, it, it's not going to sell itself. That's for sure. Exactly. But Peg Leg Porker does have that story, not only just with food, but also the name Peg Leg Porker. Do you want to explain where the game came from? Sure. Yeah. You know, um, so when I started, I started the Peg Leg Porker brand. I think the very first competition I did on my own, it was here in Nashville at a place called Nashville Shores. And I was still on my old barbecue team, but I thought, oh, I want to do something on my own here in Nashville, and we had to have a name, and so I came up with the Peg Leg Porkers. Um, most of the guys on that team grew up with me or had gone to high school with me, and the summer before my senior year in high school, I was diagnosed with osteogenic sarcoma bone cancer. So at age 17, uh, I had a, uh, a, a tumor in the top of my tibia, and, you know, it was a very life-threatening a deadly, deadly uh, tumor that is a, uh, a very lethal. And so I uh, made the decision to amputate my right leg right above the knee, went through uh, eight to ten months of very intense, heavy chemotherapy. And uh, luckily I'm here today to tell a story about it. I've met a, uh, many, many families 
uh, 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 victims of osteogenic sarcoma. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible uh, uh, form of cancer that didn't make it. <clears throat> and so the name came from the fact that I have one, I literally am the peg leg porker. I, <laughs> I have one leg and cook barbecue. And so um, it was fitting. I never had a bad attitude about it. I always felt very fortunate that I was able to make it through. I had the support of friends and family. And so for me, the Peg Leg Porker brand and the name is all about uh, survival and a celebration of life and my, uh, my zest for life and, and it making me realize at a very young age how short life can be and how much you got to kind of grab it by the horns and, and, and live without any, uh, without any regrets and, and, you know, move forward and look for opportunities where they present themselves. That's awesome. That's I, I, that's such a, that's a great story. And like, it's exactly what you were saying is you that, that comes out in a bottle, right? And yeah. it's on the back of your bottle. And sure. when you sit there and you're drinking it, that, that story comes out and I'm sure it comes out in the barbecue as well. And it's the whole brand. It's a lifestyle, like you said, and that's awesome. Yes. Thank you. We've, we've had fun with it and, uh, and we enjoy it, and it resonates with people. We get a lot of cancer survivors that come in the restaurant that uh, are, are here because they, um, because they know the story or they've heard about it. And, you know, then, uh, again, with the branding with the bourbon, we knew that when we started the bourbon that we could capture our barbecue followers. They were gonna, they're going to go drink it because they, they love our brand. And we had at the time, you know, a national and international recognition of our brand. It was, when I went to design the label, I cleaned it up, made it more refined, made it a nice linen, you know, very, uh, I'd say very sort of upper tier of a style of bottle and packaging because we also knew that we needed to capture the bourbon audience that may never have heard of the of the restaurant or the barbecue brand. And so if we could grab that audience up here and grab our barbecue audience here and you know have that equalize out, uh, then we had a you know then we had something special. And so so far it, it's worked well for us and, and we have a lot of fans of the bourbon and the barbecue. So how um, how far is your distribution? We are in eight states right now, and we are about to, primarily in the southeast, uh, we do have New York and, um, and Kansas and um, Nebraska, but uh, we just picked up South Carolina, and probably our next market, we, we, the last market that we picked up before South Carolina was Georgia, and probably um, the next market that we'll pick up would be Florida. Okay. And so this past year obviously has been hard for restaurants, but from the people that I've talked to so far, the whiskey industry has not seen the same, uh, same effects that restaurants have. So what is your experience with it, with being both in the restaurant space and the whiskey space? How has one side been better than the other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had both experiences, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, the restaurant side, we took about a 50% hit uh, from the previous year's sales. And so that was very costly and very trying and just tough to work through. Um, on, the, uh, on the bourbon side, we saw good growth. And we picked up three more states, and so that was some of the growth. And then we did our release of our 15-year Pitmaster Reserve, uh, that was a big win, and so um, we're we uh, you know we're just trying to continue that momentum with the bourbon company and continue to expand it, and then we're just trying to swing the restaurant back into uh, normalcy, and um, then we've got another restaurant uh, under construction right now. Uh, and tell me about the Pitmaster Reserve. Is that something that's been in the works for a while? It has. I worked on uh, Pitmaster Reserve for a year. We worked on the bottle design, the topper design, uh, the graphics, everything for a full year before we released it. Uh, we knew we had a batch of 15-year-old that we could release with. Uh, we did the same charcoal 
uh, filtering uh, with it, with our hickory charcoal. Uh, but it's in a nice case with an outer box uh, with the uh, different style bottle with the gold foil printing on it and then a peg leg pig topper. And so it's quite a special presentation uh, box. And in fact, we just won an award within the company for Tricor Brawn on that design. Um, and uh, and it, it's resonated well with our with our uh, consumers or with our with loyal fans. It definitely is a beautiful bottle. I'll tell you that. Looking at it on the shelf, it definitely is a beautiful bottle. Um, and so what's next? Uh, or actually, before we get there, what to explain the explain the reasoning behind the uh, the hickory uh, charcoal process instead of doing the Lincoln County process? Well, they, we we use hickory charcoal. I mean, we use hickory uh, when we're cooking our barbecue, and so we have a hickory charcoal as a natural byproduct of that. Or, and and I've worked with hickory my whole life, and we understand smoke. You know, some people thought we were going to come out with a smoked bourbon. Uh, the thing about it is, uh, it, it, I've never had a smoked drink that I really thought was worth drinking. They're always too bitter or acrid because you're burning this white smoke, and, and what you see in that smoke, the, the whiteness of it, those are pollutants. And so those pollutants just settle in that liquid, and then it's like drinking liquid smoke. It's just not it's not good. And my understanding of, of charcoal and, and burning hickory and burning various woods was that it you know, I understood that process and understood about those VOCs and those pollutants. And, and so I wanted to do something that was different that gave it a hint of that smokiness without making it bitter or acrid. And so, it, it, you know, I took samples and I literally had charcoal in a beaker, you know, in my, uh, in my kitchen, my test lab, and was, uh, was running it through that hickory charcoal and testing it out to see how it affected it and see how it uh, changed the flavor profile. And it, and it worked. It was something that I liked and enjoyed and gave it a hint of, of barbecue without being smoked and without having a bitter or acrid taste. Okay. That makes sense. So is the hickory that's used straight from uh, the restaurant? Yeah. We typically use some that I burn down in my pits uh, in the front of the restaurant. It's not, it's not usually any that we've had like a hog on top of. So okay. we don't have any, you know, grease drippings. We're not fat washing the bourbon or anything, uh, but, we, uh, but we definitely burn it down in our pit here at the restaurant. Okay. And so what's, what's the future for peg leg porker bourbon and for the restaurant? Well, we're laying down more supply now. So that we'll be able to expand our footprint and have a have a lot bigger footprint and get out there and sell more cases across the U.S. Um, we are considering a rye, uh, so that may be something that you see from us uh, in the not so distant future. Uh, we're looking for new some new different you know maybe higher proof products that people are enjoying these days. Uh, bottle uh, you know uh, bottle proof or barrel proof is a uh, seems to be a hit these days uh, or bottled in bond that's at least 100 proof seems to be a pretty big hit uh, we're always trying to source unique juice uh, you know stuff that uh, that will make a nice uh, uh, release we're working on the second revision of pitmaster reserve so this year's release of pitmaster reserve we're already starting to work on as far as what product we have and what the packaging will look like and we'll spend several months on that to make sure that it's a unique and different package from last year. So we don't want them to look the same every year. We want to come up with a different with a different box uh, each year, and um, and we think that that's what what our clientele uh, will enjoy. And then we'll be expanding into more states. We hope to pick up three to five more states this year. Okay. As we move forward. And so, you guys are. A sourced whiskey, so and right. there's uh, there are people out there that have this, they kind of see a stigma against sourced whiskey because they feel like it's not authentic, I guess. So, what would you say to them about about 
you making a source whiskey and how it's not it's not any less authentic than what um what an what a non source whiskey would be. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say to them that eighty percent of the bourbons on their shelf are source. And whether they like it or not, they you know, most of them come out of about four different distilleries. And, you know, if they want to dog a source whiskey, then they can go dog Van Winkle or they can dog Angel's Envy or, you know, one of the many great, great products that started with sourced uh, whiskey or still is a product of sourced whiskey. Um, and uh, those are great products that have proven themselves. And um, so the question is, do you like to drink it? And if you like the taste and if you like to drink it, why would you care? Uh, just like in barbecue, people can say, well, you can, you know, if you're not shoveling coals all day under live pits with direct fire, then it's not real barbecue. And I said, well, go screw yourself. You know, that that's not, uh, don't tell me how to get there. You tell me whether you like the product and you judge my product. If you don't like the product, that's great. That's one thing. But by telling me what process I have to use to get to that end product, you're not the expert on that. I am. I've been cooking barbecue for 40 years. And so I believe I know what all the methods are. I build my own smokers. I can build a brick hog pit. You know, we use commercial smokers as well as ones that we manufacture that I personally design. Um, the same goes with whiskey. And so is it. It's an easy argument for me because I get the same argument in the barbecue world. Um, and, and, and people want to try and tell you what method you should or shouldn't use. Um, you know, if you want to do it a certain way, go start your own company. So tell, me how, tell me how long you last. Uh, great distilleries have generally started with sourced whiskey because they don't want to wait or don't have the capital to wait the initial four to eight years uh, to get their product launched. That takes a lot of money and a lot of runtime. And so uh, if you see Peg Leg Porker build a distillery, which you may, um, it will probably not be a small sort of show still. We will build for production and we will build for the long haul. So we're in this game for the long haul and we think we have what it takes and uh, and we'll go, I'll, I'll argue toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody in the business about what we do or how we do it. I'm very confident that we have a great product, and we have the, uh, we have the medals to show for it. Uh, we've won bronze, silver, gold, double gold, platinum, uh, and that's at awards such as San Francisco World Spirits and also the SIP Awards. So... Um, we encourage everybody to drink the way they want. And I would tell you when people say, well, how should that, uh, uh, you know, uh, how should I drink it? I say, drink it however you want. If you bought the bottle, now it's not mine anymore, it's yours. And although I produced it, I don't care how you drink it. So if you want to mix it with a Coca-Cola, that is your business. Uh, as long as you keep buying it and you keep <laughs> enjoying my product over somebody else's. And, and it's just like people telling you what it should taste like. Uh, and, and I was on a, a tasting the other day with my friend uh, uh, Dixon uh, from, uh, from Kentucky Owl. And, you know, he said that when people tell me what I should be tasting in something, that's when I get real turned off. Everybody's palate's different. I'm not going to, I can't tell you what you're tasting. Only you can tell what you're tasting. <laughs> and so, uh, if my bourbon is off-putting to you, then you're not going to buy it again. But if you do like what you taste because it hits your palate correctly, then you're going to buy it more. Well said. Carrie. thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for listening. If you want to support the podcast, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on whatever platform you're listening on. It helps the show grow and introduce more people to the stories behind their favorite whiskeys. You're listening to Barrel Talk.